Hello, everybody. How you doing? We're glad to have you back here now into the meat of the show that we're going to uh, two topics, actually. The first one. Now, uh, before we get into this, I want to make sure that everybody understands that we are not uh, some bunch of homophobic, you know, weirdos here trying to slam people who are gay and all that kind of stuff. That has nothing to do with this. We are talking about the issue of homosexuality in the culture, but most importantly, in the church itself. Now, I wanted to go through a few little things here. First of all, there are tons and tons, heaps and heaps, as our friends in Australia would say, of material written about uh, you know the gay agenda. As a matter of fact, this particular book here, if you want to grab a shot of that, John, uh, The Gay Agenda, is a pretty uh, nice little summary. Uh, it's written by uh, Dr. Ronnie Floyd. It's a pretty nice little summary of some of the things that uh, uh, the whole sort of gay civil rights, if you can call it that, gay civil rights agenda movement has been very anxious to get through. This is, believe me, one of about a thousand books on such a topic. I would say sort of the seminal work on this entire thing has been this book by Father Enrique Ruda, who was a Cuban priest. Uh, the name of the book is The Homosexual Network. Now, if you try to find this thing on Amazon, it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars. A, a viewer was kind enough to send it to us so that we have a, uh, so we had a nice copy of uh, good research, uh, research, research. I'll be able to talk sooner or later, folks. Good research uh, uh, tool in our hands. And he really goes through here. Father Enrique really goes through here and does a very fine job on a big cultural level of explaining exactly what he calls the homosexual network. He has a number of parts in here. Uh, dedic he goes through sort of different aspects of culture including religion. And he has a whole probably 60, 70 section, 70 page section in here on uh, how the homosexual movement has kind of infiltrated or used religion as a way to kind of, you know, further uh, further uh, advance its uh, its cause. And within that big religious section, like I said, about 60 or 70 pages, uh, a lot is dedicated to, I suppose you might call the uh, uh, sort of the infiltration of the Catholic Church. And he goes through and he's got some very uh, interesting, alarming statistics and information in here. Uh, so this is kind of the seminal work that it was written by a Catholic priest uh, really is, uh, and it was written, it was published in 1982. So this is 20 years before the whole, uh, you know, homosexual clerical sex abuse crisis comes up. If you have a way to get a hold of this book, if you have an extra few hundred dollars, or you know somebody who has it, I would really, really suggest you read it. It is marvelous, fascinating in the sense, not marvelous in the sense of it's good, marvelous in the sense of the research and the detail. It's extraordinarily eye-opening. So leave that here on the table also. But with regard to that 60 or 70 page section, much of which is dedicated to the homosexual infiltration of the Catholic Church, we have on that specific topic what would probably be considered by many to be the seminal work with regard to it called The Rite of Sodomy, Homosexuality and the Catholic Church. And the author of this is Randy Engel. Now, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to say this, but this is a 1300 page tome, which goes into practically everything that you could imagine about uh, the, the uh, widespread acceptance and uh, cooperation on the part of many in the clergy with the whole homosexual movement. Not unsurprisingly, uh, or unsurprisingly, uh, that because um, a number, huge number of the clergy uh, are involved in this as either being, you know, A, actively homosexual themselves, B, sympathetic to the homosexual cause, or C, uh, actually supportive of it because they understand the way the politics and all of this works and, you know, they want to advance their careers so they don't touch that third rail in the Catholic clergy of homosexuality because they're afraid that the, as Pope Francis used the term, the gay lobby, uh, will, you know, come out against them and, you know, ruin their careers. And, uh, you know, we've heard from quite a number of priests, quite a number of priests and some monsignors and had it confirmed for us by some bishops that that in many cases that is exactly what happens. So to discuss this here further, and don't forget, after our commercial break with Randy, we're going to come back and we're going to talk with John Salza about Freemasonry. And we actually put these two topics together because they're both sort of aimed at the same thing, which is the destruction and the diminution of the Catholic faith. So first of all, we're going to bring Randy Engel live uh, online with us here. Randy, how are you doing? Good evening. Good evening. It's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you for being on. 
Thank you very much. I know there's um, a lot of people out there praying for a very successful uh, program on a very difficult topic. It is a very difficult topic. I think the first thing that we probably want to say, I mean, you, you are the author of this, and I've got to imagine that as a, a good, solid, faithful Catholic, uh, uh, writing this was probably a very painstaking, hurtful thing to do. Is that right? Yes, I would say that was uh, absolutely true. It's um, it's a very uh, uh, depressing topic. It's uh, uh, and one has to be careful when one is uh, dealing with uh, perversions of this kind that that one doesn't get burned oneself. But I have to say that God was good to me, and and um, after 17 years, it uh, it finally made it into print. Do you? Uh, what would you say is probably the most uh, uh, I, I guess to use a kind of a crass phrase, the sort of most blockbuster headline that somebody could walk away from with this going, oh my gosh, I, I, this is, I, I can't believe this. What, what would that point be after all of your research? And again, 1,300 Thirteen hundred pages. I mean, either you have a very wild imagination, <laughs> or you have uh, done quite the homework here. So, uh, what would you say is that sort of the one takeaway point that people should know, no matter how horrible it might be? Well, I think it is that um, in reading the rite of sodomy, you know, it, it used to be if you were a virtuous person. You didn't want to know or you didn't have to know about the issue of homosexuality or any other the sexual perversions. It was almost a, a form of self, uh, self-protection. And also um, you were keeping away from a, a possible occasion of sin. But that's, that's all changed now. We're, we are at war with the uh, organized forces of, of sexual perversion. And in order to do battle against these forces of darkness, um, the Catholic lady simply has to put a vo- uh, aside any of these um, um, uh, th- this um, uh, reluctance to look at reality and just uh, decide that um, I am going to become informed on the matter. Um, if there are questions, I'm going to, you know, um, investigate further. Um, people needn't take it. Uh, you know what I write word for word, and that they're free to examine the uh, the text. They're free to examine the, the thousands of footnotes, and um, if I'm in error, they are free to inform me of that, and uh, and let that be. But uh, you just can't stick the, the proverbial head in the sand anymore. The um, the stakes are just too high. Um, you know, Mike, when this whole battle started, at least came to the um, forefront, we used to look at that, uh, the, the famous alphabet. Uh, it started off with the uh, 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 so-called gay and lesbian movement. So we had the G and L movement. And then that was quickly followed by the B, which was the bisexuality movement. And then that went from uh, there to the double T, which stands for transgender and transsexual. And then we had the S and M for sadomasochism. And in the wings, we've got uh, the three Ps. We've got pedophilia, we've got pederasty, and we've got um, uh, what the homosexuals call um, polymory, which is just uh, another version of, of polygamy. And in the, and then to add it all up, we have um, bestiality. So it's not we're talking about homosexuality, but we really are directing the comments to the the whole range of of these um, uh, sexually deviant um, initiatives. Let me ask you, Randy. We have been. Uh... Uh, you know, again, you know, we have a few minutes to talk about, you know, research that took you an awful long time to compile, phone calls, visits, interviews, the whole bit you put into this 1,300-page book here. And in Chapter 15, you dedicate Chapter 15, so to speak. It's called The Special Case of Joseph Cardinal Bernadine, who was uh, the Archbishop uh. of Chicago. Uh, I think there, you know, if we're going to pick out anything uh, to, you know, sort of just make 
uh, sort of a jumping off point to help people understand. I mean, the large issues of this, I think good faithful Catholics understand the danger uh, that homosexuality poses to the family and, you know, uh, you know, good healthy development and, you know, that sort of thing. But specifically within the Catholic clergy, uh, you dedicate an entire chapter here, an entire section of the book to uh, Cardinal Bernadine. Why? Yes, because next to card the early cardinals um, who were homosexuals, um, Cardinal O'Connell of Boston and Cardinal Spellman of New York, um, the, the next in line really was a Cardinal um, Bernadine because he had such great influence on the um, on the selection of additional um, homosexual uh, candidates for the uh, the bishopric, and um, you know uh, uh, it's probably a good point at, at, at right now to, to to make this explanation. It's it seems that there are uh, there's a tendency among uh, uh, Catholics um, in the pews to acquire a mindset that it really doesn't matter if a, um, a clergyman or a religious or a religious brother um, is an active homosexual as long as he's, uh, you know, as long as he's doing his job. And most times uh, they do it rather charmingly. And uh, so it, it, they seem to be um, quite capable of of, um, uh, of, of 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 selling of selling themselves. And um, this is um, the the point that needs to be made is that the cleric who is living, or the bishop, or the cardinal who is living an active sexual, homosexual death style is almost identical to his secular brother in the sense that um, it, there, there seems to be this, this um, state of denial, which, oh yeah, we know brother so-and-so is an active homosexual, but he's really, he's really a, a, a good guy. Well... Uh, he's not like his his secular brother who is out there um, using porn or using drugs or uh, engaging in male prostitution or involved in domestic violence. Uh, he's not involved in suicide and murder and all the rest of the the violence associated with uh, with the homosexual death style, and and this is is such a, um, a, a monumental era because in fact all we have to look at is the billions of dollars that have been spent uh, to uh, pay attorneys fees for the whole um, uh, for the whole criminal pederasty scandal that has besieged the church to understand that the clerical um, uh, homosexual is just like his um, his secular counterpart, only he has a collar on. Let me interrupt you for a second, Randy. And I think that's a very good point for people to realize. I mean, you know, we have Bishop uh, Lacey, I believe his name was, up in Nova Scotia, who used to take trips, Canadian bishop, used to take trips over to uh, uh, Thailand, you know, which is a massive, uh, massive, uh, you know, underage sex market. He'd take plane trips back and forth and back and forth. He got stopped. Somebody tipped off the Canadian authorities when he was coming back into Canada. He got stopped. They took out his laptop, opened it up, and there was tons of, you know, male child porn on it. Uh, I mean, the it's something that's a very unpleasant topic that lots of people in the church don't want to talk about and it is precisely now look they don't want to talk about it for the reasons you named this is a it's a very distasteful thing to want to talk about it's one of those oh you know you just it comes sort of a saturation point which you arrive at very quickly but it's in that goodwill of good catholics that this entire kind of homosexual pederasty movement inside the church has actually been able to gain great ground because people ignore it, they don't want to believe it, they certainly don't want to talk about it if they do hear about it. So 
you know, it, I, these things need to be talked about, though, because of the danger they, uh, the danger that they bring with them to souls, to psyches, to families, to the church across the board. I mean, it's an extraordinarily dangerous climate uh, when this sort of thing gets a foothold in a diocese or something like that. Uh, but I'd like to go back to Cardinal Bernadine here for a moment. Now, you said, you know, that he had the, uh, uh, you know, like some other members of the hierarchy in the United States, you know, who've been homosexual. Uh, his he had a major influence on the bishops who got named after he was Archbishop of Chicago. Of Chicago. Uh, Absolutely. And ex explain that a little bit so people can begin to sort of make, you know, not necessarily up here at the 30,000-foot level, but right down on the ground level so they can go, wait a minute, wait a minute, and because they need to know this sort of thing. So how was Cardinal Bernadine influential in getting other homosexuals appointed to different posts and positions in the church, mid-level and higher? Well, uh, one has to remember that um, the uh, uh, apostolic nunciate here in the United States, um, they accumulate uh, information on candidates for um, the a possible um, a bishop's office. And, but in the United States here, um, the, uh, the USCCB, formerly the um, USCC, um, the, NCCB. Yeah, the NCCB. Um, yeah, Conference of Catholic Bishops, correct? Um, yes. Yeah, they, um, they, in fact, are the, uh, is the key agency for the selection of bishops. And in the case of, of Cardinal Bernardin, he had served, don't forget, he was the first um, Secretary General of the new um, USCC NCCB, uh, which was created back in, in 1965. And when he was there, he brought in with him a whole uh, group of homosexuals. So the, the colonization of the USCCB uh, by the homosexual clerics, um, that occurred, uh, well, that's what, at least, what, 30, 40 years ago. Right. And, um, and since it is the USCCB, and, or the USCC, uh, NCCB, that um, the, uh, the apostolic uh, delegate to the United States um, uh, that, that is the agency that they they go to. Um, you know, yeah, so, no, so, no, so, in other, so in other so, so in other words, the, the names of potential priests and monsignors to be made bishops are gathered by the U.S. bishops' headquarters in D.C. The Vatican gets in touch with them and says, "Hey, you know, give us a list of names to become the bishop of you know any town USA." Those names are then handed over to the Vatican. Whatever diligence or due diligence is done or not done. Uh, happens, and then somebody is appointed bishop based on whatever. And, and the point that Cardinal Bernadine had in this is that that list was largely engineered every time there was an opening, was largely engineered by him, right? Yes, absolutely. He had um, he had a tremendous power, I would say, uh, probably only second to, um, uh, to Spellman. And um, he, uh, of course, he was influential in, in so many other areas. Don't forget, he was the one who engineered the Many Faces of AIDS, the document that um, contained the, um, uh, the go-ahead for the Catholic Health um, Ministries to um, uh, approve of uh, and to disseminate information on uh, uh, the use of prophylactics. Mm -hmm. And he, he maneuvered that document right through uh, the, the, all the processes of the, uh, of the Catholic Conference. And uh, he, he was very successful. And when the Vatican uh, got around many years later, I think it was about 11 years later, to forcing the uh, conference to make the correction, they issued another horrendous document, um, which, uh, though it didn't contain that statement, uh, was very, uh, very pro-homosexual. Um, the influence of that Catholic conference and the fact that, um, uh, I mean, Bertinand was in on the ground floor, so he knew the entire structure. Um, by the time he left, he had planted 
uh, a number of, of homosexual um, uh, leaders in the various offices. So, uh, and, and of course, the, um, the, the Catholic Conference has been um, uh, homosexual in, in many different ways. Uh, it has been pro-homosexual in different ways um, through the use of, of uh, promoting um, various um, homosexual groups, especially they promoted dignity in the early stages. So it's... Um, well, well, let me, um, let me let, on going on to the dignity thing for a second. We've only got a couple minutes left uh, in this segment, Randy. But even, the dignity thing, I mean, this would help explain why for 35 or 40 years, uh, dignity or dignity groups disguised as uh, LGBT ministries in parishes all over the country uh, have such a strong foothold and such a strong influence in all of these various dioceses. Uh, right here in Detroit, certainly in New York. Uh, I mean, there's a very interesting... California is, is notorious. Yeah, it's yeah. rife with it. Uh, and, you know, you hear parish after parish. What is it, Most Holy Redeemer in the, in the Castro huh? dis District of San Francisco? <laughs> Notorious, uh, notorious. Uh, yeah, so, you know, you hear all this, and, you know, Catholics sit around, you know, just regular lay Catholics who are just raising their families and going about working and taking care of their lives really have been largely unaware of this, no other way to call it, it's been an infestation of well, the homosexual what, culture, Michael, right? Let me let me interject here. Sure. Uh, they may not know the situation, but the Vatican knows the situation the situation very well. The whole scandal of Holy Redeemer has been um, a topic of, of, uh, of just anguish for faithful Catholics for probably at least 20, 25 years. It's the parish in there San Francisco. countless letters, but um, the, popes, the post-conciliar popes, including this particular pope, Pope Francis, um, is just, they simply do not want to handle the responsibility of governing. They prefer to dialogue. Well, their job is to govern first, govern the church, and teach um, the faith and hold the faith that the apostles um, have handed down to us. Uh, and uh, th th there seems to be, there's, there's a reluctance, and until until that reluctance is broken, until we get a, a, uh, um, a Holy Father who really wants to be a martyr and really is of the nature of, of an Athanasius, um, we're just going to uh, be fighting a skirmish after skirmish. The, the Catholic Church is a hierarchical church, and in the end, the buck stops with the Pope. That is the that is the story. If the Pope is a great Pope like St. Pius X, well, then things go well. If it, they're less than that, um, things tend to, um, you know, fall apart. But yeah, Rand Randy, I'm gonna, I'm, I, we've just run out of time in this segment. I have to leave it at that. But that is certainly true, and I can, I can second what you're saying from our, uh, from our various trips to Rome. There is a great sense of reluctance. It's a kind of a combination of things. It's reluctance on the part of some people. It's frustration on the part of others. And, you know, we've had it said to us, and I, I don't want to quote who this was from, but uh, somebody uh, at the Vatican said to us that the homosexual network inside the church is so vast that we don't understand how it operates. And, uh, you know, so that's a little... Well, did you uh, tell <laughs> them to read the right of sodomy? That would have helped. <laughs> I want to give you a plug again, Randy. We have on the website how people can get to your book and uh, purchase it, read it. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, you know it's uh, marvelous work you've done, and you know, horrible, distasteful subject and topic. But you know, unless the lady who don't really have a dog in this fight and can just commit themselves to the truth, because their careers and egos and friendships and all of this aren't wrapped up in it. You know, until the lady step up and try to do something about this, I'm afraid that. Uh, you know, that's uh, we're going to have, as you said, just continuing skirmishes. So uh, thank you very much for your work, Randy. God bless you very much, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Michael. God bless. God bless. Thank you. All right, everybody, we're going to be right back after this commercial break where we are going to be talking about another distasteful subject, uh, but again, one that people need to know, Freemasonry and its effect on the church. We'll be right back right after this. The Restoration Retreat. The second annual Retreat at Sea from ChurchMilitant.tv We invite you to set sail with us this January the 12th 
for a seven-day retreat at sea to discuss the who, what, where, when, and why of what has gone wrong in the church for the past 50 years. The idea of a Catholic restoration is an immensely dense topic and will undoubtedly take a week's worth of conferences to truly understand. There are many questions circling the minds of faithful Catholics. Why have all my children left the faith? How have I become the crazy religious person in my family? What can I do to restore the faith? How can I get others involved? How did we get here and where are we going? All that and more will be on this year's Restoration Retreat from churchmilitant.tv. Retreatants will be afforded the opportunity for a true spiritual escape from emails, ringing phones, and noisy neighbors. All the rigors of the worldly life will be paused for a week of daily mass, confession, exposition, benediction, Eucharistic procession, and the Holy Rosary. All in addition to the daily conferences, terrific weather, and delicious meals with great Catholic conversation. Please click the link and we'll see you in January.